Yvette, Christian. really like the presentation so far. I think we have shown very high level of ambition, both on the commercial side, but also on the financial side. But now it's time to basically roll it up to consolidated uh, financial figures. And I will use the same approach as my colleagues have done, uh, have a quick review on the past three and a half years, and then give you the outlook for the upcoming years. So let's start with the key messages. Message number one, I think we, we will prove that we have promised what we uh, committed to at the Capital Markets Day in 2018. And Torsten used that phrase, even on the critical metrics, whether it's being CapEx or whether it's being cost reduction, you can trust us, we deliver what we promised. Second point is, if we're looking forward, we see a lot of growth. We're seeing top line growth, we're seeing big service revenue growth, but when it comes to bottom line growth, that's even higher. And I will get to this uh, when it comes to EPS or free cash flow growth. And it will happen across all segments. So we're not only relying on one second, it's basically broadly adopted by all segments going forward. Third topic on cost, look, we're in an industry where efficiency is at the center of our activities. And therefore, we announced another 1.2 billion cost reduction program for the European operations. And I think the US team has shown yesterday how they basically increased their efficiency by faster and accelerated uh, synergy uh, utilization. Fourth topic on leverage. Look, after the introduction of IFRS 16, we uh, changed the quarter to two and a quarter to uh, two and three quarters. We stay in that. Uh, we will have a return back into the comfort zone by end of 2024, and that delay, and I will get to this later on, is purely explained by the shareholder renumeration program, which has been announced by the U.S., but also our clear ambition to achieve the majority in the U.S. was 15.1%. On dividend and on shareholders, look, we are committed to stay a reliable uh, dividend player. Uh, our dividend policy will remain being uh, determined by adjusted EPS. We keep the floor, which we introduced in 2019 at 16 cent, but we're moving away from EPS growth into a payout corridor of 40 to 60 percent. Given the financial plans, I think dividends will be progressive in the upcoming years. And finally, on the sixth point is, we are reliable to debt, to uh, debt holders. We have a very strong liquidity position and we are committed to have unrestricted access to credible, uh, credit markets. So let's start and reviewing the uh, past uh, three and a half years. And let me start with EBITDA guidance, IDC guidance, and cash capex guidance. And what you can see on the chart is we promised an adjusted EBITDA growth of two to four percent, and the prediction until the end of the year is basically saying 4.4 on adjusted EBITDA. If you just focus on core EBITDA, it's even higher at 6.4. So we bet that target. On the business XUS, meaning on our operations in Europe, we basically guided at 2 to 3 percent. We will end up having a 3 percent. The 3 percent EBITDA growth is very much driven by the IDC reduction in the past three years. Going forward, we expect a more balanced uh, contribution coming from net margin and cost reduction. Second point is on IDC reductions. You may recall, as we reviewed at the Capital Markets Day in 18, um, how, we, uh, how we were uh, at cost reductions, we missed on that point. So we renewed our commitment to another 1.5 billion net cost reduction and indirect cost. And we're happy to say that we will beat that target by about 200 million to 1.7. And on cash capex, that was also a highly debated figure. We said peak is going to be in 2018. And from there onwards, we have a stable development uh, going forward. And actually, I have to report back that holds true. So let me, um, let me move to uh, the IDC development and how it all breaks down. I said we're beating our target of 1.5 billion by about 200 million. And where does that come from? So first of all, a billion of the cost reduction is coming from the German operations, meaning GIS and Germany. Another 400 million uh, is coming from Europe. 
Dominic said yesterday, we achieved already 320, and there will continue to reduce uh, costs in Europe by another almost 100 million uh, throughout the year. And 300 million uh, was delivered by uh, T-Systems. If you take a look at how you can assess this, whether this is recurring cost or not recurring cost, I would like to basically draw your attention to that picture here on the FTE reduction in Germany, and that excludes, um, that excludes T systems. Um, we will reduce the headcount by 17,000 people over the course of 2017 to 2021. And that reduction happens almost with all, uh, without any noise. It's a well-established rhythm which our people, uh, our colleagues from HR are doing with the social partner. And if you multiply these 17,000 people with average salary of 70K, that gets you to 1.2 billion uh, gross savings only coming from, from personnel in Germany. Second point where you see that cost is really going out of the system is real estate. We expect that we're going to reduce real estate costs by about 300 million over the course of the uh, uh, a time from 17 to 21. That's coming from less space requirements. It's also coming from a renewal of our service provider contract, which we did with another company. Let's move over to free cash flow and EPS. So at the Capital Markets Day in 18, we said we wanted to deliver greater 8 billion on free cash flow by end of 2021. We assume that the adjusted EPS is around 1.2 uh, euros a stock. And in case the merger is going to be approved, that was right after the, uh, the signing, if you may recall this, obviously uh, there will be dilutive effects on both sides on free cash flow as well as on EPS for over the course of three years. So what are we going to achieve? We're going to achieve actually something which is at the upper level of the merger scenario. So we expect greater 8 billion free cash flow at the end of the year, and we adopted our guidance last week, so 3.6 is coming from the European operations, another 4.5 is coming from T-Mobile US. That compares to a 5.5 free cash flow in 2017. Same holds true for the EPS. Look, uh, or let me dwell on, on, on the, on the uh, free cash flow for a second. Look, what we predicted on the European business was actually 4 billion. So we are falling a bit short on the free cash flow coming out of the European uh, operations. But this can be explained by non-operational effects. So BT suspended the dividend, which accounts for 200 million. Obviously, since the merger has closed, we don't get kind of a margin from refinancing some of the T-Mobile US loans. And IFRS uh, 16 also costed us uh, 200 million of, EBIT, uh, of free cash flow in that equation. So adjusted EPS, you see we're developing from 90 cents to greater 1.1 uh, euros. I think that is both of those uh, figures are at the upper end of what we expect in our merger scenario. So what we also did when it comes to dividend and total shareholder return, in 2018 at the Capital Markets Day, we changed the dividend policy. You may recall, historically, we were coming from, future, uh, from free cash flow growth. We now basically took adjusted EPS as the key metric. Uh, we said uh, dividend will orient itself on adjusted EPS growth, and uh, we basically put in the floor 50 cents. Torsten just mentioned the roller coaster ride on the closing process of, of Sprint. And I recall back in November 2019, where we just uh, about the federal state's uh, 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 jury or discussion or uh, trial. Sorry, I was, I was looking for that. We had complete uncertainty on what's going to happen. Therefore, we decided to basically make a call on the dividend, independent whether we get a positive or a negative result. And then we declared 60 cents and we announced a new floor of 60 cents. Look, if you take a look at what we have delivered over the past years, we are a reliable dividend payer. Our payout was in between 60 to 70 cents over the course of the past uh, three and a half years, and we will be a reliable dividend payer. If you combine our, our reliability on the dividend payout with our operational outperformance, 
this gives you the outperformance on the total shareholder return. You see us uh, with a 41% increase since the last capital market day. Tim was basically comparing us against Vodafone, Telefonica, and Orange. This is a, comparis uh, a, a comparison against the Eurostox index. And also, we bet the DAX by factor two. So what you see here right now is reliability and operational performance really pays off is, is, and is being appreciated. So let's go back, uh, let's go and move forward to leverage. So again, I'm always comparing what we said in 2018 and uh, where we're standing to now, uh, up until now. In 2018, we said, if we're getting back, uh, if we're getting the deal approved, uh, we will basically need about three years to get back into the comfort zone of our leverage. Secondly, we said, what is the comfort zone? It was pre-IFRS 16, um, two to two and a half and we basically committed to have a rating in between A- minus to triple B. So in the meantime, quite a bit of uh, things happened. First, we got the introduction of IFRS 16, and that basically uh, uh, led to an increase of the comfort zone by a quarter of a point. And to be honest, that was conservative, because if you take a look at the current impact of the leasing liabilities, they're not 0.25 points, they're 0.4 points. So that was a very, very conservative perspective on this one. Second one is the merger closing was delayed until April 2020. And what we didn't foresee at the Capital Markets Day is obviously the tower deal with American Towers and the C-band auction. If you collapse everything together, we still, given our current financial plan, would be able to return back into the comfort zone by end of 2023. So, um, let's see um, how we're moving forward, and that is basically the guidance. Look, we are confident about the future. Our performance in 2020 has carried on into the first quarter. We had a deliberate discussion what we expect from the remainder of the year. That led to that guidance increase of 200 million in EBITDA and 200 million in free cash flow. And let me repeat again, it's been equally split between a contribution from the US and ex-US. So therefore, I think we have a very strong performance in the, in the history and also are positive about the future. And let's finally, let's finally get into the scorecard. And what you see on the scorecard is on the left-hand side, you see our ambition. On the, middle, on the middle column, you see our achievements by end of 2020. And uh, the traffic lights basically indicate what we, what we expect by the end of the year. I would call this an almost green scorecard, except, except for the shortfall in the free cash flow XUS. And I think we touched the dividend policy in 2019. These are the reasons why we basically put this in yellow. So, so much about the past, so much about the past performance. Let's go and look forward. And let me get to my favorite chart. This is my favorite chart. What you're going to see is what is our prediction on free cash flow growth, adjusted EPS growth, and growthy growth over the upcoming uh, years until end of 2024. Free cash flow is expected to grow from 6.3 billion at the end of 2020 to north of being 8 billion this year to be greater than 18 billion in 2024. That translates to a CAGR of 30%. Obviously, the breakdown, and we've heard that yesterday, is very much driven by uh, T-Mobile US by contributing more than uh, 14 billion um, uh, to this overall result. But also, we see in free cash flow growth uh, coming out of the European business. What are the key drivers? Obviously, that is service revenue uh, growth coming from the US, that synergy realization, but there are also three supporting arguments driving the free cash flow. One is obviously the shift from handset lease to EIP, which improves our operating working capital. And we will also expect CapEx to come down once the merger <laughs> synergies are achieved and lower uh, special factors over time. From the US, uh, from, from Europe, you can expect a constant support 
driven by EBITDA growth and uh, IDC savings. So let me dwell on this a second and do a little bit of a fast forward. Let's assume we're on the year 2024 and we have achieved the majority with 50.1%. Then out of these 18 billion, half of the 14 billion belong to DT, plus roughly out of the 4 billion, if you exclude the minorities, another 3.5 billion from the European operations. So 10.5 billion euros would be allocated to DT shareholders. This is more than two euros per share and an increase of more than 100%. Second one on adjusted EPS. Look, we expect that adjusted EPS is growing from 120 uh, to greater than 175, and that translates to a 10% growth. There's going to be a small dip and uh, this is basically uh, between 2020 and 21. This is basically can be explained by the positive impact which we had on the fixed price option in uh, 2020. But we're, what, what we're going to see is we're going to see a constant increase of EBITDA growth and a constant decrease of depreciation, which basically gives you an indication that this growth is not back-end loaded. It is coming with steady growth starting from 2020. Uh, two onwards. So therefore, I think, again, this is a greater 175 prediction, and it, it's coming more in a linear curve rather than a back-end loaded curve. Third one is ROSI. So you, you, you've seen our ROSI being 4.6% end of 2020, and we expect it to grow it north of 6.5% uh, in uh, 2024. Bear in mind, our ROSI definition is a very strict one. It's after tax. It does include all special factors. It does include all working capital changes on the NOAA, all lease liabilities, and all impairments. So once we get there, we will have a significant distance versus our average cost of capital, which is right now around about 4.5%. What is the key driver? Between that ROSI, obviously our NOPAT is significantly grown faster than the NOAA. So let's move over to the US and go quickly through this. And you, you've seen that numbers already. The US is supposed to go, uh, grow from 21 billion euros in EBITDA to 27 and, uh, or 28. That is basically a 7% growth. And if you just exclude the handset leasing for a second, the core EBITDA will grow at 10%. The cash capex is actually peaking in 21, and you've heard Peter saying yesterday that he's expecting uh, the 24 level, which is 8 to 9 billion, already in 23. And also, we talked about the massive free cash flow, which is coming from the US. So on capex, as I said, the peak is in 2021, and we will return back to normal levels uh, starting from 23 onwards. Let's move over to uh, the European business and take a look how this will evolve going forward. So what we're going to see in the European business is a steady growth of EBITDA, growing from 14 billion in 2020 to 15.3 billion in 2024, and that relates basically to a 2 to 3% uh, CAGR growth. What you also see is that this EBITDA growth is supporting our larger uh, capex envelope of 8.2 billion by 2024 in the European business, while well, still allows to grow uh, free cash flow. What we're also uh, betting on is that the EBITDA development will be more balanced um, coming from net margin growth as well as uh, cost reductions. So um, on cash flow, Guys, we always had that question. We also had it yesterday in the, in the discussion. Look, we kept our promise on the cash flow over the past three years, and we will keep our promise also what we're indicating here. So we keep the 8.2 billion, and you shouldn't be afraid about uh, that we basically have to exceed this. And that will support the build-off plan which uh, Srini and uh, Dominic presented yesterday, both on the fiber and the 5G rollout uh, side. So being committed to that envelope is important, and we will apply, as we have done in the past year, a very strict allocation policy on where and how we want to spend 
um, and, where we and how we want to spend CapEx. Next topic is digitization. As you can see on the chart, we are taking a ver fairly holistic view on the digitization within DT. And we're basically taking, all, taking a look at all relevant parts of the business, being in the front end or in the back end. And we're continuously optimizing and digitizing as we move forward. We have a program right now um, across the most leveraged activities being defined between Germany and uh, Europe. We track it from 2020 to 24 onwards, and we have a consistent review process on how we're making progress on these uh, key initiatives. And let me pick out two examples which have been mentioned yesterday by Claudia and Srini already. The first one is e-sales share. Obviously, you can take a look at e-sales share. This is a great measure to reduce sales cost. You will have no commissions for intermediaries and so forth. But I think we always have numerous um, reasons why we're doing digitalization. Cost reduction is one of them. But the other one is the e-sales share, as we go on and develop it further on, will allow you to give you more personalized, ideally a person-specific offer based on your needs. So digitization for me is always a combination of lowering cost, but also improve customer experience. And same holds true for the IP migration. If I summarize the IP migration in one word, I would say you get a better product, you allow our service organization to better serve you, and it allows us to reduce costs because we are reducing energy costs and reducing all platforms. I think that's the way how we're thinking about digitization, and we assess the EBITDA impact by 24 of more than 300 million supporting our European businesses. But there's also um, just, I would say, classical IDC cost reduction beso besides uh, digitization. And the 1.2 billion additional cost reduction program I was alluding to uh, breaks down into the German segment by 700, Europe by another 300, and T-Systems by another 200, which brings our indirect cost down from 17.5 billion into 16.3 billion. What are the key levers? The key levers is fa fairly identical to what we've done in the past. So real estate will be a big one. So we have a range in here of 100 and, uh, to 200 billion. I expect it to be at the upper end. Claudia was talking about uh, retiring old IC systems and simplify the IT landscape, which is going to give you another 100 to 200 million. Obviously, we rely on the leverage effects which we are achieving through our uh, joint venture buy-in, which gives you another one to 200 million. And the next one is obviously people-oriented. We will have a very, very strong focus on overhead structures and to make their life easier, but also to let uh, FTEs go, where we basically bet on a 500 to 600 impact and the rest one is going over the, over the other cost categories and, and, and saving discretionary uh, costs. So all up, it's a 1.2 billion program. Um, and I think uh, it is suited. It looks a little bit smaller than the 1.5, um, which we called out in 18. But bear in mind, A, our baseline is lower, and B, we need uh, <coughs> a certain fraction of uh, people for the network build-out, both on fiber and 5G, which allows us uh, to basically um, reduce um, costs at a lower level. Let's move over to the finance strategy. Look, Tim often said, a strategy is a strategy is a strategy. And same holds uh, true for our finance strategy framework. We stay committed to be a reliable dividend payer and to have undisputed access to the debt markets. What does that mean on the equity side? Obviously, we're committed to be a, a dividend player, and I get to the details of the, new uh, of the new policy in a minute. Second one, we got approval on the AGM to basically have the allowance until 26 to buy our own uh, shares back. Do I expect this to be very likely in the upcoming two to three years? No, I don't, but it's still we have the opportunity. We talked about the ROSI. Our ambition is that the ROSI will be higher VAC starting on from 2022 onwards. And on the debt side, not a lot of changes. We keep the comfort zone, we keep the equity ratio, 
and also on our liquidity reserve, we keep the policy that li liquidity at least has to cover um, 24 months of maturities. Let's move over to the dividend policy. So, as I said, uh, in 18, we introduced adjusted EPS as the key metric, and we said it should orient, the dividend payout should orient itself according to that growth, and we had a floor of, uh, of uh, 50 cents a share. We basically moved that up to uh, 60 cents. We have paid out dividends in the vicinity of 60 to 70 cents over the past four years. And what we're going to do with the dividend policy going forward is that we're going to keep the EPS as the key metric, that we're going to keep the minimum payout to give you a guarantee on, on the payout, but we're moving away from EPS growth to a payout ratio. Given the EPS growth, which you have seen, which was uh, about 10%, you can assume that uh, this dividend will be accretive and grow over time. Let's move over to the debt side. Again, um, what we said is we remain within our comfort zone, which is two and a quarter to uh, 275. And we said at the capital markets day, we will be back into the comfort zone after three years. This assessment excluded basically two things, the shareholder remuneration in the US and also our ambition to achieve 50.1%. Uh, if we are doing this, with the shareholder remuneration and the 50.1%, that will obviously uh, slow down the deleveraging impact, and therefore we will basically will be back in the comfort zone by end of 2024. The peak of the um, leverage is expected to be this year, and then we'll, it will gradually uh, uh, go down. And bear in mind, if we are getting into the comfort zone in 2024, by the end of 2024, the share buyback in the U.S. officially continues uh, into 2025, and you heard Peter saying it will not stop um, after 2025 either. When it comes to our maturity profile, you see that actually the average maturities which we're going to have over the fa uh, next four years is 3.6 uh, billion. So it's very balanced. You don't see any spikes. By the way, that holds true for uh, the maturity is also beyond 2024. We will receive another uh, 4.7 billion US dollars coming out of the US, and the first chunk is coming in in 2022, with almost being half of it. And you see that we have a very strong liquidity position, and that liquidity position, which was 17 billion at the end of last year, and on average will be around 14 to 15 billion, uh, covers our maturities over the next 24 months really well. So um, before I basically wrap it up, let me just talk a little bit about ESG. And what is our contribution to ESG? It's basically around about four points. One is on procurement. We already have a policy in place that suppliers have to sign a strict supplier code of conduct, and this is going to be monitored on a regular basis. We will increase the importance of ESG as a criteria in the vendor selection process. We don't have a final number yet, but there's a clear commitment that we're going to do this. And we're working jointly with external and internal uh, resources on tracking whether scope three emissions are being reduced within our lenders, uh, vendorscape. Secondly is we will introduce sustainability linked bonds into our bond framework. Thirdly, we will become more, um, even more transparent uh, on the CR reporting. Look, uh, we received a lot of prices on the CR reporting, but I think there is uh, reporting standards coming from TSFD and uh, SASB, which we have to adhere uh, to and which we're going to do. And the last one is, even our DT Trust is geared toward ESG um, uh, investing. Actually, the pension fund started to do this uh, in 2013, and the trust has moved into that direction in 2019. So after that short excursion, uh, let me conclude in our finance strategy. Look, if you see that wheel, as I said, we will see 
a massive bottom line growth on free cash flow with a 30% growth, on EPS with the 10% CAGR, and also by an increased uh, uh, ROSI, which improves by another two points. That massive free cash flow growth will allow to uh, pay shareholder returns fr uh, from uh, T-Mobile US over the course of 23 to 25, which accounts in total uh, for up to 60 billion. Those planned shareholder buybacks will be a significant le uh, lever for us to achieve that 50%, but you also heard uh, Torsten saying we don't have to uh, decide this tomorrow, uh, we have time in order to, to get there, which allows us as DT to take part on the long-term growth of T-Mobile US, and as those shareholder returns will not stop after 24, will also allow us to faster deleverage our business uh, in the years beyond 2024 or give you a higher return as a shareholder. I was talking about the equity side and the dividend policy that we're moving to a payout ratio. I was also talking about the net debt, uh, the debt side, sorry. So let's wrap it up and take a look to the commitments which we put out there. So on, is that chart on? Can I have the next chart, please? Can we move on with the chart, please? No? Ah, OK. Very good. And you presented it yesterday, Tim, so. OK, so if we don't, it's coming? Come on, let, let, me, let me just wrap it up. On, on revenue growth, we're a bit, pretty much at 1% to 2%, which is comparable to the last capital markets day. We also basically give a guidance out for service revenue growth, which is 3 to 4%, which is the new guidance. Adjusted EBITDA will be raised from 2 to 4 to 3.3 to 5%. Obviously, I talked about the free cash flow growth of 30%. That relates to a 10% uh, in the past history. We have an accelerated EPS growth, an accelerated ROSI growth, and we're committed to stick with the uh, cash uh, CapEx guidance at 8.2. Same holds true that we are committed to reduce the IDC uh, by 1.2 billion over the course um, of the period until end of 2024. That is basically the commitment from the group side. Um, and I will finish here. Look, you can be rest assured that this team is committed to deliver as we have done it before. And I learned from Torsten, whenever their ball is going through the middle, you're going to pick it up. OK, thank you. Very good, Christian. And so, um, so that brings us